Um, Shawthor is a Chief Product and Data Officer at Outthink. Um, he's got a really interesting background covering a number of different uh, size companies, ranging from startups through to scale ups. So, really looking forward to hearing uh, what Shawthor has to say. So, uh, at this point, Shawthor, if you're happy, um, I'll hand over to you to share your screen and uh, go from there. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Enjoy. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, welcome. Um, so I'm just going to talk about managing remote teams on and offshore. Um, so just a bit about myself. So currently I, I've got multiple hats on. So I am a Chief Product and Data Officer at Outthink, which is a cybersecurity startup. Um, and then I'm also the Data Science Practice Lead for a, a global agency called Tribal Worldwide. Um, and I'm the founder of Subatomic Analytics. Um, uh, which is an analytics consultancy. So I do quite a few things uh, and it's enjoyable. I realized a few years back that you don't have to do one thing, you can do many, there's no law against it. Um, in the past, I've been uh, the founder and managing director of uh, an analytics consultancy called Stream Intelligence, mainly operating out of Indonesia. Um, I was also a managing partner at Wonderman Data and Insights. Um, so I ran the uh, Data and Insights division for Wonderman. I headed up the head, head of data at Adam and Eve DDB, um, and I was head of business information and customer data strategy at ITV when they launched um, the ITV player. Um, interestingly, I, I started my career as a lecturer, actually, after having completed my PhD in psychology. Okay, so in terms of uh, sort of what experience I have in terms of managing teams remotely, so I, I've managed teams all the way from, you know, US to India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Bangladesh, a combination of office-based remote teams, as well as um, sort of individuals who, are, who work remotely. Um, so for example, in Malaysia and Atlanta, um, they were remote individuals working uh, mainly from home or sometimes from service offices, but individuals, they weren't in a fixed uh, office location. So I, I've, I've sort of got quite a few experience over the last decade or so uh, managing uh, teams uh, remotely on and offshore. And obviously now in the UK, uh, a lot of my team, well most of my team is now remote, um, that they sort of work, they all work from home um, and, and that's been interesting. I mean, what is a remote team? So, I mean, it's just literally what I'm sort of putting up here. It's a group of people who are brought together for a unified purpose or project. Um, and also while they answer to the same organization, usually the same boss, they are physically in different cities, um, offices or even countries. Okay, so in terms of the presentation, I'm gonna go through sort of running a remote team, some basic principles, hiring sort of the right people, which makes managing a team very easy. Uh, communication, which is absolutely critical and I'll probably be reinforcing that throughout how to maintain productivity or how to make sure your team is productive. It's very hard when teams are remote that they can, that you can maintain productivity as though you were there with them um, and how to keep them engaged. And then hopefully some key tips for those of you who are probably thinking of starting up a remote team or, or have started and, and want to know how to sort of run one. Okay, so some basic principles, uh, and this does actually doesn't apply to remote teams, whether they're on or offshore. It also applies to teams that are, you know, if you're in the office, there's sort of principle that you should apply uh, regardless. So the first thing is, it is your team, okay? So a lot of the times with remote teams, especially when you're not seeing them physically day to day, it's quite tempting to hand them off and either they self-manage or they're managed by someone else. So if you have a remote team that's office space, for example, in another country, it's quite tempting just to let the manager of that team just deal with everything and, and you um, sort of are hands off or an arm's length away. So the key is to make yourself visible and that's either by sending regular emails to the team, updating them on things, doing virtual team meetings, um, but also acknowledging that things happen in that team so that they feel that you are connected to them, that you are, um, uh, know, that you know what's happening in that team. So it's, it's really good that you do make yourself visible, make sure that you are invested in that team and come across so it's your team, okay? The other thing is a base principle is have a senior tier if possible, you know, one or many people who can manage or lead the team. It is very, very important when you have remote teams, even if the individuals are remote, um, and, but they're all in one locality, they don't have to be in one country. So for example, you know, they, they may be scattered across Southeast Asia, they've only got an hour or two time zone different, but you do need someone to lead. 
okay, someone to manage and lead the team. If you don't have that trusted tier, then you end up doing the kind of management where it's one-to-one -one with everyone. And, and that's really hard. It's really tiring and it's very hard and it's not effective. The other thing to bear in mind, which um, is, is typical when you are managing teams, especially if you go East, English may not be their first language. Um, and therefore you need to be very good to learn to speak or write instructions which are clear and concise. Um, so, you know, it, it is good practice to be able to get other people to read emails that you send to people just to make sure that you're not inferring or assuming things that people should know when they don't know. Unlike being in the office in the same place, people would overhear things, they would, um, you know, respond to things. There they don't have that uh, interaction, so therefore they don't really know um, what's going on. The other thing is expect some team, same, the same team dynamics. So there's always dynamics around you know, people and, and, and how they deal with uh, management or how they deal with work or tasks. You know, some people want to do some things, some people don't. So try and understand your team. You don't have to know everybody in detail or, or individually, but you should actually understand what their strengths are, um, what they enjoy doing so that you can um, you know, accommodate their needs and help them grow. Okay, so the first step is obviously hiring the right, right people. And again, this is probably a principle that you should have if you're managing an analytics team or a data science team, is have a set interview process. Um, I have seen too many pr uh, interview processes are just haphazard. You know, people just have interviews. There could be one, two, five, you know, random people. Create a structured interview process. Um, I typically have a three-stage process. Um, and, you know, so the first one is pretty much an informal discussion with someone. Uh, I try to get involved, try and spend at least 15 minutes on that call just to get to know the person, see if they're a good cultural fit, fit which I'll talk about later. The second step is probably more formal. Um, and the reason it's more formal is that you want someone in your team to assess them, technical skills, presentation skills, communication skills, all that kind of stuff. And then the third part of the interview should be a wider team where they either dial in or they're meeting someone somewhere where they get to know because you need that uh, a fit, that cultural fit of individual. Because if they don't fit in with the team, then you find that as, because they're remote, they just become more and more distant. Um, and it's also very important when they're office space, when they're all in the same office, because you won't be able to observe the team dynamics day to day. So you need to make sure that the team who they're going to be working with have also been part of the interview process. So they've met the person before they've um, before they've been hired so that there's that connection when they join on the first day. Like I said, you, you should try, if you are the leader of the team or the leader of the organization, you should try and uh, at least spend 15 minutes talking to them. So when I had my startup, for example, Stream Intelligence, and I set up the team in Indonesia and Malaysia, I pretty much spoke to everyone for at least 15 minutes when we hired them. That was easier. When I was at Wonderman, you know, we had teams in India, we had teams in Prague, we had teams in New York. It was harder, okay? You, you know, some things are harder, but I at least try and uh, sit in on a, a, a team call with, with the person when they're interviewing, a team interview, uh, just to hear them, see, you know, if I could judge them if they're cultural fit, the way they respond to questions. And the reason for that is that once someone's hired, you get busy, they get busy, and you don't check in. And it could be months before you actually go down uh, to that office or, you know, even longer. And then it's, it's very hard because this person started, there could be other people who are more new after them and you've not had a connection with them. So speaking to them right at the beginning is quite critical to establish uh, the right sort of culture that you want. Again, the other thing is if you are going to set up a remote team or you have a remote team, hire a good team lead or manager. Again, this is really, really critical. If you don't have someone who's good at conveying instructions and managing a project, you will struggle, okay? Even if that person's remote in themselves, but they need to manage other people. If you are the team, if you are, if it's your startup or if you're heading up a division or a team, um, if you don't have someone in that time zone area, it is very hard. They don't have to be an excellent analyst or data scientist, but they need to be a good leader and manager in that area. And then finally, get some feedback regularly and directly from colleagues, because it is quite important that you um, seek that and, and, you know, review outputs and, um, uh, you know, even dial in on team meetings. The other thing is obviously, like I said, communication. This is quite key. Get regular check-ins in, okay? Uh, either do it first thing in the, in the morning when you wake up or last thing. It does depend. So if you're, always, if you're dealing with teams in Asia, then try and get check-ins first thing in the morning uh, with them. You know, I, I try and aim for at least two check-ins a week. If I'm running a really short project and things are urgent, we try and do a check-in every day. You know, also be good at writing instructions when you brief the team. It doesn't matter if they're remote or local. Good, inst good instructions, clear instructions are essential 
become more essential if the first language is not English. And also when you send those instructions, it's quite timing. So one of the things I learned is that when you have teams in Far East Asia or even the US, if you don't brief them before they start their day, you pretty much lose half a day, if not a whole day. So if you're given a task or you've been given something that you need to hand over to your team, make sure you write the instructions and, and give, get it through to them before they start their day. So for example, if they're in Asia, they would have been up for three hours before you get up. So if you get it to them the night before, then you know, they can work on it when you check in on the first thing in the morning you can clarify if anything's gone wrong. And also the other thing is uh, get feedback to your team, project success and the failure. Most teams want to know what happened when they did a piece of work, was it good or bad, did the client like it? It's, it's quite important that you do have that two-way communication. Productivity. Okay, how do you maintain productivity? One of the key, I mean, really important thing is share deadlines, internal and external. Don't just say, I need this by this day, okay? You need to say, look, we've got a client presentation on this day. I'd like to see it three days before. Let's have a check-in, this, this, this. And you plan it out. If you don't do that, the team won't know what to expect. And then also share those expectations. What, what are you expecting from them? I mean, I found in the past when you work with a brand new team and you're trying to get uh, uh, establish a ways of working, I create templates. I say, look, I want the data to look like this. I want the graph I or I want the PowerPoint to look like this. And I will pretty much sketch it out and send it to them and say, look, when you do the analysis, I want it to look like this. Um, team collaboration, you've got to also try and get your team to collaborate, get them to share stuff weekly or monthly and give them the opportunity to share knowledge. I found the best thing is when they take it upon themselves to collaborate. So when I've been in, in companies where I've had teams across several countries, I've tried to instigate the, the team uh, meeting and then get people within that to uh, maintain and run it themselves so I'm not involved. And that's really good because then when the team are collaborating, they're sharing ideas, they're sharing experiences, um, things that you would have expected if they're in the same office, but now they're not, but you need to give them that opportunity so that you can share it. The other thing about productivity, which is uh, sometimes overseen, is working hours and holidays. You need to adjust, or they may need to adjust um, their working hours or, uh, based on your office hours. So, um, you know, when we had the team in India, they, they started two hours later. So I think they started around 10 a.m., uh, 10, 10.30 a.m. actually, and then they finished around uh, 7.30 p.m. Um, and you, you need to be very mindful when you are arranging meetings because if you overrun by an hour, you know, for you it's two o'clock, it's going to overrun to three o'clock, but for someone it could overrun from 7.30 to 8.30. So just be mindful of that because that impacts productivity. And finally, know when public holidays are. Uh, you know, it is amazing, uh, you know, some countries like when I, when I set up my Indonesian team, I did not realize how many public holidays they were, mainly because of the multitude of religions they had. So each religion has its holiday and everybody gets a public holiday for that. So be very mindful of that because you don't want to set a deadline the day after a public holiday when no one's in the office. Um, and then also it's really good to set, you know, to create away days off sites where you all come together. Uh, a, it gives the team something to look forward to that they're going to meet everyone. But again, when they do meet, they have the opportunity to connect with the wider team and share experiences. And then, you know, apart from the productivity, <clears throat> you've got to stay engaged with your team. Okay, so you should try and aim your team, visit your teams uh, at least once a quarter. I mean, I have, I've managed several teams and, and anything less than one, once a quarter, it, it doesn't work. You're not connected people. It's too much of a gap. And when I set up brand new teams, for example, when I set up teams in Prague or in Indonesia, I, you know, in the first year I was pretty much going every six weeks. Um, to at least see them because if you weren't going that frequently, you couldn't do it, especially when people were being hired, team, team was ramping up. The other thing is also, you know, you're going to expect losses, okay? Um, just the same for uh, local teams. You know, if you hire some people, some people are just going to be bad, hire, bad hires. You made a mistake, so you've got to let them go. Um, but some people are actually good and, you know, you haven't got the room for progression within your company. So help them spread their wings, find another company that can move on. One lesson I've learned the hard way is do not try and keep people with more money. It does not work. You just end up in a, a bad spiral of, of just paying people more and more, uh, which doesn't work. They don't stay anyway. Um, <clears throat> stay connected. So uh, create opportunities to engage with people with video calls or in person. Again, with time zone differences, try and find an organic time that works for everyone, not just for you. So don't think, oh, I'm free at 10 a.m. I'm going to make everybody uh, come in at 10, uh, do the call at 10 a.m. Try and find an organic time that works works for everyone, um, especially if you, if you work, when I worked uh, across New York and um, India, it, you know, for me it was easy, I was in the middle, but for the two extremes, it's very hard, it was either really early or really late. So try and find a natural time that works for everyone. Um, and then finally, to keep your team engaged, you know, you've got to create opportunities to give them a variety of work and that they can progress and have a plan. 
Okay, you need to do the annual review. Sometimes you find that when you have local teams and you're in the office with them, you, you don't really uh, have annual reviews or stuff or they slip or stuff. It, it, it can't slip when you have remote teams. They need to know that you are thinking about them, that you're thinking about their career and progression um, so that you know they've got somewhere to go. So key tips to round it off. Um, if you are going to set up a t remote team, ask yourself, why do you need a remote team? Okay, if it's just for costs, you won't find it always works out. I found out the remote teams are useful when you've got, a, when you've got talent availability in, in the market, in the um, location you want to open the team and there's talent scarcity where you are or it's client proximity. So the client's in that market and you need a team close by so they can liaise with the client and get things done. Especially if you're running analytics, that's pretty much on a day-to-day -day, like powering loyalty program. Um, check if your competitors operate in the local market. Another um, lesson you will learn very quickly, they will be the number one people who poach your talent, okay? Um, if you, you train people up, you, you know, you look after them and then you find that there is someone in, in the, a competitor who would, do, who would just snatch them um, and you just won't be able to uh, keep them. Um, also, the other thing to look, look is, do you have the temperament to manage a remote team? Um, things can get easily frustrating, especially when you're on calls, on video calls that are dropping or, you know, you've got tight deadlines and, and you know, the, the, um, you, you can't you're not there physically you need to understand if you're able to you know have the temperament to do that and the other thing is are you willing to travel it makes a huge difference to productivity and how engaged a team are if you are willing to travel and go and meet them um, and also you need to be a good leader i guess that applies whether the team's local or remote but you do need to be a good leader just managing them is not enough you need to be able to lead them so just to conclude my talk um, if, you're going to, if you're going to run a remote team or you're going to start one up, hire the best person you would, just like you would if, you were, if they were local, but focus on communication skills. You'll find that's really key. I found that sometimes hiring someone who's not the best technically, but has great communication skills makes a huge lot of difference. Have regular check-ins and have a schedule of them in the diary. Even if you don't use them, have them in the diary. You know, so therefore, it, it, it gives... The, the, the teams are licensed to contact you and say, can we have the call? I want to talk about something. Whereas if you don't have, in the, have it in the diary, things slip and then you know, they, they get to a point where it's, it's become too much. Um, be visible, like I said, whether in person or electronically, that, that is quite key, um, that, that you are visible, that you're either emailing them, you're either doing video conference, or even if you're dialing in and listening, they'll see your name pop up on the conference call and they'll say, oh, at least he's listening in. And that's quite good. Understand the culture and be respectful of local traditions. Um, so like, like I said, you know, uh, public holidays, but even things like, you know, if when I, I've operated in Muslim countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Bangladesh, and like Fridays, um, though they, that's not a pub bank holiday for them, like in the Middle East, um, they, they do have the Friday prayers and stuff. So you don't want to be scheduling meetings around that time because it's quite important for them. Uh, so just be mindful of that. Be mindful of time. Like I said, don't just expect people to be available. So, you know, if it's 5, 5 p.m. for you and you just need to call someone and they're in Indonesia, for example, it is almost midnight and they, they would not be, you would not be expected to answer the phone. Um, and then, like I said, understand uh, who your competitors are in the area. That is the most likely place your people will go to, but it's also probably the most likely place that you will go to uh, to recruit talent. So um, that's me. Thank you, David. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Shawful. Uh, flew through that. There was definitely some very good takeaways uh, and we've had a few questions coming in already. So uh, we'll save those th uh, for the end. Uh, thank you for that, man. And uh, we'll leave you there and I'll invite uh, Ori to turn his camera on and we'll catch you at the end, Shawful. So um, Ori is a senior manager uh, in R&D at HSBC. Um, again, very diverse background, long established background, so really looking forward to uh, hearing him speak. Um, in particular, um, the, the talk that we were sent through, Let 1000 Flowers Bloom, it definitely caught, caught my attention, so I'm looking forward to uh, hear what Ori has to say there. So um, in terms of summary, um, Ori's gonna talk about essentially building a team for innovation. Uh, so I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Ori, and uh, yeah, I'll jump back on at the end when you're finished. Hello. Uh, hi, welcome everyone. Thanks for having me, David. Um, you will see a nice little backdrop there because I don't have any slides. I'm going to go freestyle rapping for a few minutes. I hope you guys are cool with that. So yeah, before we get to the teams, I guess we're all here because we're interested in data science and what the hell is that after all? I mean, uh, it's it's been a buzzword for many years. In fact, uh, 
the reason I'm in this space, I suppose I used to be an academic mathematician back in the day, up, up until 12 years ago or so, but then uh, I'm gonna be quite blunt here, I wasn't learning enough, so I was like, data science, let's go and do it and earn some more. So, but what is it, right? Everybody's talking about it. Uh, it's in the news. It's in, like, a lot of people are looking to hire data scientists at the moment. I mean, we've seen a lot of Venn diagrams. Uh, this is what a data science uh, can do. And they have computer science skills and mathematical skills and statistical skills and all of that. Basically, to me, it boils down into three sort of major categories, right? The first one is business intelligence. The second one is innovation, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. And the third one is engineering. These are the three sort of major areas that I see data scientists being uh, busy at. And it's very important because uh, you need to have all three, right? So business intelligence lets you know what's going on, lets you know what problems you've got, or where are you doing well, where are you doing great, or, uh, you know, whether systems are breaking or stuff is not working, etc. So it's absolutely necessary, right? What we used to call business analytics, I mean. Uh, now it's part of data science. Then, um, last one, engineering. I mean, without it, nothing works, right? Uh, without it, we would all be great mathematicians living in caves, probably, and uh, dying at an age of, uh, I don't know, 25 uh, uh, on average, uh, engineering is hugely important. Uh, data scientists, um, I suppose even theoretical data scientists have to be very close to engineering uh, and they need to understand the, the sort of the restrictions that engineering uh, presents and the capabilities of their engineering. So there, there needs to be a very, very good harmonization between the two. And then we have what we call innovation. This could be model building, for example. Uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about a little bit because it, uh, it's one of the most exciting areas for me in data science, right? There you go. That's the data science for me now. Um, what is innovation? So innovation can be a lot of things. Uh, I will try to shed light from some different angles. I will definitely not exhaust. Um, uh, the subject, but innovation is finding new solutions to new problems, new solutions, sorry, to new problems, yeah. So design a new theme for the sp spacecraft that is going to go to Mars, right? We didn't have this problem 30 years ago. We may have been thinking about it in the 60s, but not in the 80s, for example. Uh, so someone is looking for a new solution to, to a new problem. It's, it's, it's an interesting one. Also, you might find old solutions. You might be looking for old solutions to new problems, right? So, for example, the British government announced that some clinical trials of a drug that was known that is known since the 50s is having a very positive impact on the reduction of deaths um, from COVID-19, right? So that is a new problem. We didn't have it before December, and an old solution is coming not quite right to, I mean, to the rescue, but it definitely, definitely helps. So um, it needs a lot of research in the past. It, it requires some knowledge of what have other intellectuals before you have done, you know, and uh, what sort of problems, uh, what sort of old techniques can be, can be applied uh, to today's new problems. Uh, um, new solution to old problems, all kinds of permutations, you see. Um, Energy provider wants to have more accurate uh, electricity meter uh, readings, right? Uh, predictions and forecasts, etc. Uh, I don't know. The uh, worldwide, the central banks, they're having inflation estimates that basically they're correcting every three months because they're off, right? So that's an old problem and maybe a new solution can, can improve, you know, people's lives uh, in, that, in that way because better forecast means better preparation, means, uh, you know, better planning, etc. And then the final one, to what I consider innovation, I mean, in this sort of super short talk, is continuous improvement. This is key, continuous improvement. If a data science team doesn't continuously improve, they're dead. It's like this environment, in, in, to my eyes, and in my experience, is extremely, extremely aggressive, right? You have to be a racehorse and you have to run, I mean, at 
maximum capacity all the time. That's it. Uh, this sounds a bit challenging, but I will tell you, it's it's amazingly exciting. I mean, it's it's one of the things that keep keep me in this field, quite frankly. Um, uh, you solve a lot of problems. I mean, if you continually innovating, right? Um, you don't need to worry about IP. You don't care about that. I mean, they can stall any intellectual property they want. I mean, you're gonna, you're always gonna be one or two steps ahead of the competition. For example, it also develops uh, people's intellect amazingly. I think, um, and people look back and look at their own progress, right? Uh, and they say, "Man, it's unbelievable what I was doing a year ago, and what am I doing now?" It's like it, it looks like childish, you know, you know this this sort of thing. Um, now it's a very very exciting field because the problems that we have not solved is almost are almost infinitely more than the ones we have uh, satisfactorily basically. So um, when we're talking about innovation, um, you know, we're talking about academia. There's a lot of uh, intelligent people over there doing stuff, but uh, it, again, to my experience, industrial innovation is in the forefront of everything is in the bleeding edge of, uh, if you like, uh, thought development and knowledge development, and then uh, academia follows. So while I hold a PhD in maths um, uh, since, I don't know, what is it now, 12 years ago or something, I feel that uh, in the workspace I've done six or seven PhDs, I mean, um, you know, since then. Right, so, so continue, con continuous innovation, uh, um, I think, is key, I mean, for a host of reasons. Uh, not to mention talent retention, by the way. I mean, uh, you retain good talent if... You see, data scientists are very interesting animals, right? Like, they're very they're beautiful as they're intricate, right? They need to be stimulated, they need to be progressing all the time, they, wanna, they need to learn all the time, um, they need to be creative, uh, they need to feel that their work really has an impact on the on the society and the world we're living in. Uh, this is what I found uh, the most motivating factors. Uh, money is important, definitely. Uh, and I, what I would say is that uh, if you're a very good uh, data scientist, you should be paid accordingly for it. And if you have a very good data scientist working for you, you should treat them like a superstar and splash all the cash that you have. I mean. Uh, we're talking about uh, solutions that, uh, I don't know, from my experience, I mean, I've, de I've developed uh, stuff for multinationals uh, many, many years ago, and they're still selling it, right? So don't, feel, don't be shy in, uh, in asking for what is right, and don't be, I would say, don't be shy in actually paying for talent. It's, uh, they, they deserve it 100% in my view. Now, when it comes to innovation, something that is important, and talking about money kind of thing, is that innovation requires research, and research is very expensive. That's key, right? Why is it expensive? It's expensive because uh, data acquisition is expensive sometimes. Model validation and check-ins are very often manuals. Uh, I already mentioned data scientists are expensive, are expensive beasts. Um, also, I mean, uh, experiments, you know, let's say you, you design a spacecraft, uh, you have only a couple of launches uh, that you can fail, right? Like experiments are exp extremely expensive. So what do you do if you manage a team or if you're a member of the team, you've been given a budget, right? And you need to do something innovative, something that perhaps no one has done before, right? Um, but that's in an, enterprise, uh, in an enterprise context. So this leads to make financial sense as well. So basically, my, uh, my practice over the years have distilled into basically having tiers of risk because research comes with risk, research fails. I mean, uh, 95 to 99 of all pharmaceutical uh, research fails, right? That's why, that's why some treatments are so expensive because, uh, you know, the research takes billions and billions, right? So the way I deal with this is basically uh, risk tiers, so um, I introduced three risk tiers uh, when it comes to research. The first one is a team that basically takes care of what exists in production, if something exists in production. Uh, that is very important. I mean, this keeps the lights on, right? And this is the prerequisite 
for having uh, some other members of the team to actually do the really advanced stuff, the really experimental stuff, which is truly the stuff that can change the world, I think, uh, and have changed the world, in fact. Um, so that is, that is important, keep the lights on, uh, have people really familiarize themselves with existing solutions. The second thing is like have a middle layer, a medium layer of risk, which is um, uh, basically MVPs, right? This comes with experience. This requires a little bit of experience. I, I, I don't care how smart you are or how many PhDs you have. Um, it's this uh, sort of intuition that we develop over the years in what is more likely to work and what is less likely to work. And in an MVP, um, probably you want to go for things that innovative as they may be, they are mostly likely to work. And the third tier is basically the, the most exciting of them all, the most advanced of them all, which is basically uh, break new paths, right? And these are the people that, uh, these are the high skilled people that uh, know very well the literature, uh, they have worked for years, um, they understand the, the whole business environment they operate in, and then they want to revolutionize it. And if, you're, and if you, as a, as a data science manager, it gives, you, it gives them this opportunity, which is rare, relatively speaking, uh, it's much less rare than 20 years ago, but still it's, it's, a, it's a rather rare opportunity, uh, then I think you should grab this opportunity with, with both hands. Because not many times in your career, you're gonna have, you're gonna have the, um, the chance, if you like, to, to do something that you're gonna be remembering, uh, I don't know, till the end of your career or something, and be proud about it, right? Like, this, this is something that I did, and you know, I helped the world in this or this fashion kind of thing. Uh, I'm running out of time. I want to touch on a little bit, uh, finally, on uh, the structure. Uh, I've talked about, you know, the idiosyncrasies of a data scientist, the way that these people need a vision. They need a grand vision. Uh, they need to have space to, de to develop their own visions. They need space to experiment and come up with their own ideas, even, even if they're different to yours. I mean, uh, you need to create you need to create this sort of uh, team spirit that, quite frankly, slowly but surely, makes you as a manager redundant. That is my goal as a manager, to be redundant, to, to, to create teams that self-organize pretty much, right? This comes with maturity, and that's why I'm a big proponent of permanent teams that are together for years and years. It's almost like basketball or football teams kind of thing. Uh, where people, where you can see people mature pretty much by, by the month, right? And they reach some levels that uh, they have such an understanding, such a deep understanding of the business, the business problems, and also the, the, the potential methodological innovations that they can introduce that they wouldn't go anywhere else, including that the salaries are good kind of thing. Uh, um, and, th and this is it. This, I want to I wanna sort of close with this. Um, so where is innovation born, right? In my mind, and in my view, innovation is born into the mind of an, or into the intellect of an individual. It's not necessarily a collective thing. It's something that someone that is immersed enough in the work, that's why I don't give your data scientists, don't invite them into many meetings, they hate them. They wanna stare, they, they, they wanna stare at the screen and really be embedded in the problem, have laser focus. Otherwise, you don't achieve greatness, I don't think. Uh, I mean, it only takes a, 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 a meeting of 30 minutes to completely lose your focus for the rest of the day. I mean, it's, um, it's entirely possible. It depends on the individual, of course, to an extent. Um, so, and this is, after, after this immersion, right, of the, of the data scientists into the problem, this is one of the most brilliant, most groundbreaking ideas come, and this is the ideas that we need to foster, basically, right? Now, what is the role of the team? I see the team as a hive mind, pretty much, as, as if, if the, an innovative idea is the, is, the, is, the, is the seed, then the team is what makes this idea germinate and flourish, pretty much. It keeps the researcher in check uh, with reality. Um, it, it provides different points, uh, different points of use for the same problem that the researcher, quite often because they have this focus that is a must, they cannot really indulge in. And this is the interplay that a data science manager, I think, uh, this is the fine balance that uh, they, have to, they have to hit between individual brilliance and team brilliance, right? And um, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Sorry if I was a bit overrun.
Man, I love that. I love your style, straight in there. Uh, mate, you, you were shooting for some grand uh, topics as well to cover off in, uh, in 10 minutes. And I'm sure more of it will come up in the panel discussion, actually, in terms of, you know, how do you bring innovation out of people and, you know, can you teach it and stuff like that. Uh, equally, by talking to this particular audience about how much uh, data scientists should be paid, uh, I'm sure you had a very receptive audience for, for that one, man. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll uh, get you to turn your camera off if that's okay. We'll get you back on at the end. Uh, and then for now, uh, if I invite Aji uh, to turn on his camera uh, and microphone. Uh, Aji is uh, VP of Data uh, at Chattermill. Um, he's going to be looking today at business outcomes, linking customer feedback uh, with business metrics. Uh, keeping things moving, I'll jump straight over to you, Aji, if that's okay with you. Cool. Let me share my screen. Great. Uh, so yeah, as just mentioned, um, so I lead the data science function at uh, Chattermill, and I've been uh, at this startup for about nine months or so. And Chattermill is obsessed with one key thing, and it's all about um, surfacing important insights um, from customer feedback data. And typically, that's text data. So like natural language processing is, is pretty important for us. Uh, before I sort of dive into the topic of business outcomes, um, I sort of wanted to ex uh, sort of explain why and also give a tiny bit of my um, background to kind of contextualize this um, lightning talk. Um, so I sort of have dual background, so co both commercial as well as uh, academic. So yeah, for the last 10 years or so, I've, I've been customer research, data science. Um, so both consultancy side, but also in-house. So before joining Chattermill, I was head of data science at Sky. And on the academic side, my background is in computational linguistics. So, uh, so I work full time at Chattermill, but I'm also a postdoc um, in computational linguistics. Now, the reason why I'll talk about sort of business outcomes um, from a sort of managerial perspective uh, is because a lot of the times, uh, at, you know, AI startups, but also other companies, you sort of see a lot of really hyped up data science, but sometimes you don't see the, the immediate impact it has on commercial metrics. So, so that's, that's my main sort of motivation um, with the talk. But in order to do that, I'll, I'll sort of explain a tiny bit about what Chattermill does so that uh, it makes sense when I link it to commercial outcomes. So at Chattermill, we have a CX platform. So it's, it's a software as a service um, platform. And the main task we have is we, the challenge we're solving for is taking a snippet of feedback and then looking at what are the key themes in that data uh, and looking at, you know, is, is, is it negative and positive as well? Um, in some cases, neutral. So instead of taking a whole comment and saying it's about one particular topic or one particular sentiment, which a lot of people, others um, do, even like major players, what we do is um, something called aspect-based sentiment analysis, uh, which, yeah, we find really interesting and, and cool, but also most importantly, commercially very useful for our clients. Um, and this, uh, you know, like looking at, for example, um, the second uh, comment here, you know, the loading is slower than previous and sometimes doesn't load, but it's very easy to use. Um, you know, you can probably imagine that this is feedback from for an app and, and immediately using this um, uh, apps uh, approach, um, you're extracting three different types of aspects as well as uh, specifics around like w whether or not they're positive or negative. So it's quite nuanced and it's like, yes, it is deep learning technology. I'll, I'll talk a tiny bit about that uh, around how you can see ease of use is positive um, because it's very easy, easy to use. However, it's glitchy and, and buggy and that's obviously a negative here and as well as speed um, because of the slowness. Now, uh, very quickly, the way this is done is like, yes, um, we have some initial data that we then uh, using topic modeling, some other methods we extract um, a theme structure. Um, and this theme structure, by the way, is a way of looking at problems or from a customer research perspective that are data driven instead of you know conducting new research and then like you know a market research using surveys etc and analyzing that data you know we, we use the text data from reviews etc to then understand what are the key things that matter to customers for a given organization we develop a model um, and as long as that model is robust enough uh, we then can have ongoing data to then predict uh, you know what these sort of key topics are now in, in addition to that, like, you know, we, we emphasize depth and speed of insight. So that's really important, uh, especially like from my sky background, you know, 
internet had to be quick, but also, they also had to be deep and actionable. Otherwise, it was kind of pointless, right? Um, and you know, one of the kind of things we we surface are things like okay, phrases such as constantly missed has all of a sudden increased. You can see that it's outside this confidence interval, and that is really um, spiked fairly recently. So this is a recent example from from June. Now. That by itself doesn't really tell you much other than, well, this phrase now is being used a lot more by your customers. There could be many reasons for that, but in some cases, that might have negative, literal, if any, business impact, right? So how do you sort of filter all that data to then reach an understanding of what might be um, associated with outcomes? So this is where, like, based on a lot of market research experience from my side, but also like more recently with um, our NLP technologies. If you're interested, it's, it's using transformers. Um, and you could, the main difference is we are trying to position ourselves in a way that is completely different to traditional survey research, where you might have a, a ton of different statements like brand I trust or brand for me, and they're all very samey. So the overlap is high and usually I, I sort of, call them as sort of vanilla metrics because they're all very similar. Whereas um, the kind of relationship we look at are fairly distinct and, and the themes we extract are quite nuanced as well. So, you know, it's really about extracting these new, uh, unique facets of customer experience for, from your data because the level of correlation between these independent themes is um, very, very distinct. Um, now, linking this in, linking insights with business outcomes is, uh, is really what I'm passionate about. So yes, the data science side is interesting, and uh, yeah, we we have a lot of great talent that that love that side. But um, you know, ensuring that using this data and using the the sort of format we analyze the data with, as we said, analysis, we also get a better predictive relationship. Um, obviously, it's not causal, but, but it, you know, at least a predictive relationship with things like NPS, Net Promoter Score, um, but also things like customer spend. So not only are we trying to link things with soft metrics like NPS, but also, yeah, hard metrics like customer spend, uh, customer lifetime value more recently, but only on a very small number of organizations. So I don't want to generalize, but yeah, NPS and customer spend, we've done that on like uh, dozens of cases and, and that has been um, uh, quite optimistic. Now, if you compare that to the sort of industry range, I've used my own range. <laughs> so in some cases you don't have much predictive relationship. Um, in some cases you do. Um, and, and you can sort of see it, it does perform f fairly well. Now, in terms of sort of the next steps for us and like what I think is really interesting in the industry, um, obviously there are uh, others who are also work on these types of developments in data science is to, you know, basically start creating links between structured and unstructured data. Like we've had, we've heard these terms for a long time. Uh, I've been in the industry for like a decade and yeah, these terms have always been around, but I think, only fairly recent are we starting to link sources like customer feedback directly with metrics like customer lifetime value. So we can actually quantify um, the sort of Im impact levels. Now that can also be done with conversations. Um, so we've, we've focused on the text analytic challenge first, um, but now we're also looking at things like uh, speech uh, and, and other such metrics, uh, sorry, data inputs to then understand the, the relationship. And that's really um, where sort of, yeah, I also think ideally more of data science um, can focus on, which is the sort of strategic um, side of things, because yeah, there's a long history in marketing and market research of doing a lot of qualitative research um, and very long surveys that bore participants and, and now hopefully data science um, is helping this, this industry as well. So yeah, that was it for me. Thanks for listening. Awesome. Thank you very much. We are flying through this and it's good to see a load of questions coming in as well through the Q&A. So uh, if everyone could keep, uh, keep them coming, that would be great. Uh, as mentioned, if you have a specific question for Adji or any other speakers, please do just uh, highlight it to them. Uh, one thing I'd say to the speakers though, don't, don't worry about typing in any uh, answers or anything like that. Uh, we'll be sure to uh, speak with you about them at, at the end. Uh, so now uh, we're going to come to our last lightning talk, uh, which is with Bagya. Uh, Bagya, if I could ask you to turn on your uh, camera and microphone. 
Uh, Bagia is a, a principal data engineer at Quantum Black. Uh, I was really pleased to have her involved actually because uh, I think a key part of uh, any data team is that you know how they interact amongst themselves and with different parts of the business so it'd be really useful to get uh, Bagia's take on things I think so uh, I'll hand straight over to you Bagia um, and uh, yeah I'll be back on at the end before we start the panel so thank you very much. Thank you David thank you so much. Good evening everyone and I'm so happy uh, today uh, to present this because it's one of my favorite topic why data engineering is critical for data science. Right, before I start the talk, I would just like to introduce myself. Um, what's my background? Uh, I did my uh, master's in mathematics in India. And after that, I joined, before joining Quantum Black, I've been working with Wipro, iGate, UBS, GE, uh, almost around like 11 years. After that, I started my career in Quantum Black in like three and a half years ago and joined in October 2016. And after joining QB, I expanded my domain experience uh, with uh, so many other businesses as well, banking, healthcare, telecoms, energy, and as well as uh, with uh, pharma as well. And started data engineering around nine years back before nine years i don't think there is a term called data engineering uh, so i have seen the evolution of the data uh, starting from the business intelligence and uh, you know extracting the data and building the data marts data warehouse and then going the data into the uh, into the bi and as well as the advanced analytics space which is right now so I would like to, uh, you know, discuss about the data science process in general and would like to understand also take you through what we do at the moment in the company. So the Quantum Black McKinsey is like a business consulting. I think most of you know, if you don't know, it's then uh, like a Quantum Black is an advanced analytics company, which is like a parent company is McKinsey, which is a business consulting. And we do uh, work with uh, quite a lot of uh, business domains and as well as working with uh, a lot of interesting problems. So when we working with that, with any advanced analytics project, this is how it starts. Uh, we deal with the raw data, like uh, the data in uh, like spreadsheets or the PDF or anywhere uh, like in the cloud, it doesn't matter really. So as a data engineer, uh, we start doing the raw data ingestion and we link the raw data. And once we do that, then it goes into the data uh, scientists like a create variables format. This is how generally it works as far as I know, like in most of the companies. Whereas if you see the, these three icons means like it does simply looks like, okay, 20% of the work. But when you come to, uh, you know, the cleansing of the data, data profiling, data wrangling, we literally spend like around 80% of the time doing it, uh, the whole data science process. Ideally, even when you start doing the variables as well, you will be like, you know, doing the filtering of the variables and then, you know, joining with different data sets, you will be facing a lot of issues. And uh, there comes like, you know, the data engineering uh, help a lot. The reason being, we are not even involved just with, you know, ingesting the data. It is more about like, you know, understanding the concepts of the data, like what, what does it actually mean from the business sense? It's not just that, you know, you have a, some table or you have some file. It's not about that. It's about what is inside that. Like when I say pharma, like whether the trial is complete on time or not, you're looking at that. So you need to understand the real medical terms around that. And we're so lucky in Quantum Black to work along with the data scientists and as well as visual designers. Also, if required, we'll be working with the doctors as well. If it's a pharma project, then we have to understand the medical terms, then we'll be working with the doctors as well. So that's how the business and knowledge plus the data engineering and plus the data science built together become a whole set of like a data science project, the successful data science project. Also, when I go into the next level, then will be like started doing the modeling, building the features. And later on, we'll be, you know, the importance of independent variables if required. And the data scientists check the results and iterate the process. So this is like an ongoing process. It's not like once the data engineering 
cleans the data and gives the data, it, it, the, their work is done. It's all about like, you know, understanding the data, also giving the, the models and identifying the target variable. What's the unit of analysis you are working with? These are all quite important. And the SME feedback plus client feedback is quite important. Like here I'm referring to subject matter experts and as well as the clients. You need to have a steel core meetings and you know, you, as data is a critical, uh, it's important to understand whether, you know, are you dealing with the right amount of data and right data or not. So once you've done that, then the data will be uh, imported to the dashboards. So, here I am referring about the data science process, the client input, and as well as the process, and also the input modeling and the number of iterations, what's going to happen and all. Let me give a quick example. Like we have an X spreadsheet of like 10 variables and you ask to cleanse the data. Yeah, it's just 10 variables. I can quickly do it. Maybe you use an Excel spreadsheet or you know, you just simply like use uh, filter just in the spreadsheet itself, it is doable, right? But whereas when it comes to the, you know, if I'm talking about a PDF or I'm talking about like terabytes or millions of data, then what happens? Then you have to use some technologies, like a clever methodologies. Probably it's more data, you have to do like a distributed systems, like a Spark or you have to use PySpark in order to understand like, you know, in order to understand and perform better and get the variables input or some profiling and all. So if this all can be done by like data engineering who actually understands which technology to use and what to use and what are the best inputs for the data science process. So this is, how the process works from data science process. And uh, that is the reason why I feel like, you know, uh, also I have actually observed and also have uh, seen the proof that data engineering is increasing day by day. And everyone is realizing without the data engineering, the data science uh, project can't be delivered. So that's the message I would like to give. Also, I always get questions around like, uh, what's the feature engineering, how the data engineers can help around that. So on that point, we, we normally make hypothesis. Once we have that in normally like in actual, uh, Although Kedro is one of the open source as well, it's available. It's for the data source framework. And Studio is one of the uh, tool. It's like uh, we use that for mapping, tracking the hypothesis data sources. My here, I'm what I'm trying to say is not like use the quantum black tools. Here, my message is more about like you use the right tools in order to track the data sources and hypothesis and linkage. And using writing Python and PySpark is what we do generally in, in most of the projects nowadays. Uh, this is the just the key message I wanted to give it basically, like what are the core skills for the data engineering? Uh, because there is always a confusion between what is a data engineer and data scientist and machine learning engineer. So it's, it's a like, if you are client facing and you have the right technical expertise around like uh, how to deal with the data and all, and also you are good at the domain data models, then you are the right person and having, uh, I try to list down a couple of technologies we use as well on the right side. So, so after uh, all of the slides, I wanted to say like uh, data engineering is quite critical for a data science project to be delivered. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Baggy is hidden away. I need to get you to all come back uh, if that's okay. If I could ask all of the speakers uh, just to turn their cameras back on. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for giving, uh, giving your talks there. Um, I'm going to keep things moving, actually. We, we've had a good number of questions coming in. Uh, I've got a few pre-prepared as well, so uh, definitely going to start firing some questions off. Um, I'm going to try and keep a rough format, actually. We've actually had quite a number of questions come in 
I guess from people making that first step in the data science journey and obviously you guys are all hiring for your teams you've obviously also been there yourself so uh, it'd be nice to cover off a couple of those questions first for the people making that first step in building their career and um, we've then had a, a number of questions about how to structure teams and, and how to get some of the business outcomes that they're looking for so um, I'll jump straight in and um, a couple of questions I'll go straight to the very first question actually that's come in there uh, from Emmanuel um, they have a PhD in economics and uh, have good academic experience they've got some skills in R and Python and SQL uh, but they're actually struggling to, to get that first step uh, from you know that first commercial role um, when you're looking at hiring people for your team, when you are making that first step in the journey yourself, it'd be useful just to get you know, 30 seconds from each of you, if you have any tips uh, in terms of what you look for in a CV um, or, or any tips to get that first step in the journey. So we'll start with you first, Bagya, um, and then we'll come to each of the chaps too. So we'll just take 30 seconds from each of you, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's like, I, I would suggest like anyone who is actually starting a career should start thinking about uh, the what's the data science process means and what does a data engineer do and what is a machine learning engineer do and what's a data scientist do and also think about the technologies what they have to you know develop on and reach out to someone like uh, who is already in the industry can help them out uh, to understand like well, how it works in general and uh, doing a degree or a certificate would also help these are the general things i would suggest and uh, we look for mainly for as a data engineer fellow we look for a mathematics or the computers who have actually a bit of SQL and a Spark cloud experience or a cloud knowledge and Python. This is what we tend to look at for data engineers. I'm just giving one example, so yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Ori. Is there any tips for you for, for people starting out or when you're looking at CVs? Yes, uh, Emmanuel, A, send me your CV, B. Uh, I like the sound of it, B. Uh, man you really gotta be good at something right so if you say you know r you really really gotta be fluent at it right and uh if you know sql i mean you know do your practice and go to your interviews and just amaze everyone that you're gonna be able to answer live questions in sql or live coding questions in r and you're gonna be hired i guarantee you i mean I have hired repeated the people like that, and I particularly enjoy hiring people straight out of, out of the university, in fact, but they gotta be good, they gotta be badass, you know? I mean, this sort of thing. Reach for perfection in one small thing or two small things, that's gonna be enough to land your job, I think. Thank you very much. Very interesting take, Ari. Cheers. Uh, Aji? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think given given that sort of R was mentioned and like those skills might already be there, I think it's important to just hone the specific skills that are really required for a specific job. So um, and and make sure you you nail those requirements. So if it's like for example in the customer research, um, you know having not only just really good R potential Python skills, but also like an understanding of like okay why am I doing this analysis? What's the point? And and sometimes articulating that. In, in sort of marketing sectors and media sectors is also important. Um, and that's what s some of those uh, employers will look for as well. Thank you very much. Shawful? Yeah, so I think, I mean, as everybody said, great advice. Um, I think, you know, hone your skill on a tool. So whether it's Python or R, be very good at it. The other thing is, you know, with data scientists, a lot of it's research methodology, right? Sometimes the question is even articulated in the way that you need to answer it. So you need to be very good at understanding how people ask questions and how to answer them. And then look at the domains you want to apply to and find out, you know, case studies, research around white papers or how people have solved problems in those areas. So when you are applying, you know, you can provide context to your CV. Um, even if you haven't got the experience, you know, you, you can put down this free data sources out there. You can, you know, use tools like Python and R, which are free and just state the things that you've been able to achieve um, with those data sets. And then, like I said, try and focus in on a domain that you're applying for and make it relevant to that area. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I think probably, uh, you know, I don't have an opinion most of the time, but this is probably one thing I, I can help on a little bit. Uh, my background was as a data engineer for 13 years, and now I run a recruitment business. So I'm 
probably the only one that's, that's done that. And the thing that I would say is for your first role, take ownership of looking for your first role. Don't just send your CV off and forget about it. You know, be proactive, follow up with the people that you're contacting, follow up with the companies, go to the events. You're already doing the right thing, attending webinars and stuff like that. You know, meeting people and taking ownership of that first search uh, is something that I would definitely recommend to, to everybody for the first role in particular. Um, Again, very quickly, I'll maybe just fire to this one, one or two of you because I don't want to just purely focus on, you know, getting that first role. I would like to get into some of the, you know, how to maximise the teams and stuff like that. Um, but another couple of questions that we've had in that sort of area. Uh, we've had one question saying, you know, I haven't got a PhD. Uh, is that going to hold me back? I've got another question here from Lily saying that they're doing a part-time degree. Uh, is, I'll probably maybe just go to um, Shawful and Ori on this one, and then we'll come to you other guys for some of the other speakers. But, you know, do, do people have to have that degree or do you look at other things as well? Um, from my point of view, I mean, I've, I've actually got an apprentice who hasn't even got A-levels, so um, I don't look for degree and stuff. I look for attitude and aptitude, right? If you can learn something um, and, and you can learn it quickly and you, you can show evidence of uh, self-learning, then, then that for me is, is good enough. And I think a lot of the time in data science, as it's an evolving space, as things are, you know, sort of being... Uh, uh, changing you know they need we need someone who's going to be able to be a self-learner self and evolve with it so you know like I said show evidence that you can learn you can learn independently and that you can learn things pretty quickly even in fuzzy environments where things aren't that clear-cut fantastic Ori absolutely agreed no you don't need a PhD is the answer to that uh, but you've got to be good that's a different story um, Having said that, uh, PhDs are not to be sniffed at. They do show some things, uh, but they don't show your intelligence, for example. That they don't show. They may show that you have enough, if you like, mental strength and willpower to do something on your own for years for very little or no money. These are all good qualities that come with a PhD, but the actual fact, couldn't agree more with Shortful, uh, no, you don't need it. I mean, uh, some of the best researchers I've had the privilege to work with never had a PhD, never will get one. Um, and they are, yeah, they're doing PhDs on the work, you know. Perfect. I think with the PhD, it teaches you to do the research, doesn't it? So it, it's it's the years of experience in, in that background, but it's not necessarily the qualification. So uh, fantastic. And um, one of the things that you mentioned in your talk, Ori, which are, uh, has been highlighted here by uh, Christina uh, in her question is, um, you mentioned that you were keen to, you know, have stability uh, in your team, um, and you know, once your teams were stable for years, that's how you got the best out of them. I was keen to get a little bit more, you know, from you about how you do that. But I was also actually also keen to involve the others in that as well, because uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see whether they've got the same viewpoint that you need that st stability to be able to then start to deliver, uh, or, or how they approach it as well. So, uh, yeah, start with you, Ori. Um, you know, how do you aim to get that stability, and what, what is it that that gives you? Right. Uh... I'm going to be like as brief as possible. Uh, it really, as an introductory comment, it really depends what kind of work you do. You can perfectly hire a or work with a contractor for six months if you want a run-of-the-mill vanilla type of supervised model to be built. I mean, that's absolutely fine. You don't need, you don't need a stable team for that. Mm -hmm. But if you really start tackling difficult problems, problems that a lot of people have, uh, have taken a stab on and they haven't uh, solved it, really, really hard tasks, then this is never going to happen by one individual in isolation. No matter how good they are, I don't care how good they are. Uh, it's almost, so, so where do you start? So for instance, we're talking about supervised and unsupervised learning, right? Like supervised learning can be a very difficult problem. Some supervised learning problems are unsolved to this day. So I'm not playing it down, but even if you go to a much harder, different order of magnitude, harder problems of unsupervised learning, right? Uh, then this is stuff that you simply cannot sort out in three months, right? The, 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 the bit that is uh, super important is imagine a game as a, as a sports team or something, teams that play together for, for many years, they know each other, they know how, how the other member thinks, they know their, uh, where they're strong at and where they're not particularly good at. And, it's, and they start basically self-organizing themselves. I mean, this is the beauty of that, and this comes with time, right? Uh, David, there was a second leg to the 
question. Um, it was more like how, do you, how, how do you maintain that? Yeah. Well, you need career progression. You need acknowledgement of the work, uh, which is a prerequisite for career progression. So it's not, uh, to, maybe there is a way, but to me, it sounds impossible to keep a truly talented team stagnant for years. I mean, I wouldn't stay in that team myself. So uh, you need, these people need to be rewarded, but need to be rewarded and, and need to be rewarded handsomely, but on uh, value that they're adding to, to the business and to the world at large, I mean, quite frankly. So you definitely need some sort of room for these people to grow, I think. Also, um, equally important is that these people are doing interesting work. Um, it's very hard in a, in a data science team to only do cool stuff. You have to do dirty work as well. And mostly I do it for my team, to be honest, because nobody wants to do it. So I, I take this on as a manager. However, um, you know, they have, to, they have to create new stuff. This is how a scientist, if you like, of any kind, feels proud about themselves and feels, feel motivated and feel, even for less money, they would stay, they would stay in a job that they have good relations and they're producing stuff that, you know, are building up their careers in this world. Very short answer, I try to cover everything. It makes sense. I think as well, you mentioned sort of pay, that that's a factor to a point, but then it has to have all the extra stuff as well, doesn't it? Somebody else is going to pay more, simple as, I mean. What do you do? Um, I think actually, if I could bring you in, Adji, at that point, um, and then I'll come to you actually afterwards, Bagya, because um, I'd be keen to see how Quantum Black uh, and also how Chattermill have, uh, have approached this. So it's, it's a little bit, you know, following on from the question there that Ori's answered, motivating your team, keeping them engaged, but also, you know, how you, um, how you structure your teams. Uh, would be quite useful both both at Chattermill and in your previous role at Sky uh, and then perhaps get a little bit of a take from Quantum Black and then I'll, I'll come to you as well after the shortfall if that's okay but I'll start with you Adji. So yeah and sort of Chattermill and Sky were sort of complete and different ends of the spectrum so at Chattermill it's, it's a fairly flat structure um, where we have um, so the team consists of uh, machine learning engineers um, who obviously are sort of in, in between an engineering team, which is um, independent of data science. And uh, then we have data scientists. Who, um, some of them are research scientists who are looking at the latest architectures in LNP, NLP. Uh, others are more looking at insight side. Um, and then we have uh, like full-on research scientists. Um, they, at the moment, because we're like, Chad was like 55 people, they all, the data science team still reports into me directly. Um, uh, and we work with cross-functional teams. So uh, yeah, we, we have smaller sort of streams uh, across the business. At Sky, it was a complete opposite <laughs> um, where, I mean, it was, it was a very large team of roughly uh, 35 core data scientists and an engineering team of about 20. Um, and we had sort of management structures. We had like senior managers, managers. Um, but yeah, still, still larger around, we, we had a data engineering team, uh, which was part of the data science team in customer research and then we had uh, a core data science team and then we also had uh, a special team for media which was data science communication because um at a place like sky you need to be very good at communicating complex stuff simply okay and how um a little bit of a follow-on before i get to you bagya how, how do you make sure that um you know data scientists working in different parts of the business how do you make sure there's kind of like a central you know communication channel where people know what each part is doing yeah, so that was, that was actually really hard, and I don't think uh, we did it like uh, perfectly at all because it would be quite a challenge to do that at Sky. But um, all, you know, in in on our London campus, we had roughly seventeen thousand people. So the way we arranged, organized it around stakeholders, and, and typically would have like two thousand stakeholders, is that data scientists from the research team would be part of some of the business meetings that these stakeholder groups would have. So if it's at Sky, it was like broadband, content, content discovery, Sky Sports, um, to make sure that, you know, the data scientists in my team knew their business stakeholders much better than like I could have because I was across everything. Um, and then they really understood what was important for those stakeholder groups as well. And that they worked together with the marketing inside strategy people. Um, so it was sort of a, a, like a hybrid between an embedded model where you know they're sort of let loose entirely and still like a central functional team yeah 
I love this. I love always hearing how each company uh, approaches it, actually, because uh, I don't think it's 100% solved, to be honest. But uh, Bagia, at Quantum Black, uh, how, how do you guys structure your teams to, to get the best out of uh, the data you have? So uh, we have uh, guilds, basically, like we have data engineering guild, data science guild, and we have visual designers slash UX, and as well as we have technical delivery team and there is a product team. So we have all the gills and whenever, as you know, we have business consulting, whenever we have a client project, normally we go as a team. Like it, one, it depends on the complexity of the project. It will be like one or two data engineers or three depends on that. A data engineer, a data scientist will be mandatory uh, for the project. And then we have a nice combination of a business consulting of engagement manager and engagement director uh, from McKinsey or uh, sometimes even from Quantum Black. And we will have a UX or a visual designer in the team if in case there is an involvement of the visual designer. That's, if not, then this is the particular team we are looking at. Sometimes we do have, as I mentioned in my talk as well, like we do have experts such as doctors, or if you are dealing with some problem with the pharmaceutical or a banking expert, if it's a banking project. So it depends on the project, we will have an experts as well working along with us. And there is a role uh, such as translators who actually looks after the business analysis and the documentation also helps with the business requirements. So this is the, uh, we do work as a whole team when we are going to the client projects and as in the gills uh, we are like 100 data engineers globally and we are like around 120 or 30 data scientists so yeah it's pretty definitely thank you very much uh, i'm going to come to you shawful but I i'm going to change the question a little bit slightly um First of all, I loved your talk because um, you know managing teams remotely in different countries, given the current situation of the pandemic, everyone's found themselves uh, you know managing remote teams. There was a lot of takeaways, whether it was in different countries or whether it was managing the team that you were previously in, in your office with. Um, and one of the questions that we had to come through there was, um, you know, when you're managing remote teams, be it different regions or just remotely in general, and um, how do you resolve conflicts? Um, between the different regions or, or, or just when you're working remotely. Um, I can see obviously you've put a bit, bit down here, but it'd be useful just to hear you talk about it if that's okay. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll expand on that. I mean, I think the, the key is to set clear objectives. You know, you, if you're doing any project and you've got people working individually or in a team or collectively, however they're doing it, they need to know what they're trying to achieve. And I don't mean the, the immediate objective, you know, like, oh, we need this data in a report or we need... Um, you know, the data clean, you need to set the more global objective and for the team. So you need to say things like, look, you know, we're either working for this client or we are the client. We need to deliver this output or this product to this stakeholder, whatever it is and why they need to deliver it. OK, then what happens is if you end up with conflict where you've got multiple teams and I've experienced this at Wonderman where I've had multiple teams, like I said, from New York, Prague, India. And, you know, there's, there's so much budget I guess I had and, and you know uh, promotions and pay rises or just uh, allocating training and stuff what, what you have to realize is that you're never going to get keep everybody happy okay that, that's just the, the the core when you're managing whether they're remote or local okay and it's going to be more so now now you when you've got people working individually even in the UK you know what, what you what you had individualism will be now more amplified because people have got their own styles and, and they want to work their own way so what you've got to balance is between how can you meet your company's objectives how so how can you deliver what they need at the same time make sure that, that, that everybody's I wouldn't say you can keep everybody happy but at least keep everybody content okay um, and then review okay then review so sometimes you might say look i've had to, you know you would focus on one team or one person above another and you need to make that clear you need to say look i did this because this person's been here longer or xyz or it might be that there's a project where you know there's a new data set there's a new um, a technology that someone wants to experiment with and you've given it to uh, one person above another or one team above another explain it be transparent tell them why you made the decision and how that relates to the business objective not to your individual uh, sort of whims and desires but how it relates to the business objective so people can see that you at least put some objectivity in that decision making and then try and be fair the next time okay uh, what i found is that sometimes you have to also take a risk so i've had 
teams or individuals who probably aren't strong at a certain tool. And the problem then perpetuates itself because if you don't give them the opportunity to use that tool, they're never going to be uh, good at it. So sometimes you've got to find a safe project where you think, you know what, I can afford to take the risk to let this person have an opportunity to grow in this tool. And you've given them. And if they don't succeed or if they don't, uh, if they don't achieve what you want, at least they, they can feed back and say, look, thank you for the opportunity, but I obviously probably didn't meet the objective that you wanted. And you can have a more a balanced discussion that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, I say it's amazing, actually. People have different skills, but it's, it's amazing how some people really do struggle to communicate concisely. Um, and, and that is definitely a key part of all of it. So, uh, mate, that was very, a very concise uh, answer. So I think one thing that I was keen to get for, from the panellists while I've got you here, actually, is we're obviously in a very unique situation at the moment that was thrust upon us with the pandemic. Uh, I'm sure you're all working in, uh, you know, offices in central London, perhaps with a little bit of remote working. But now everyone's been thrust, you know, thrust to working from home, working remotely. It'd be useful just to get a couple of minutes from each of you about how, you know, how that's impacted your teams uh, and, and what you think that's going to look like over the next six months, um, you know, and how you're going to make sure you stay productive. So um, I'll start with you, Bagya, and, and then we'll run through to the guys as well. So, yeah, how, how has it impacted you guys at Quantum Black? What does it look like now? And, and what do you think it's going to look like over the next six months for you? Uh, I would say the first two weeks, uh, it's a bit awful like because we travel a lot in general also and suddenly it feels like we all are like stuck at home and started working from home and all so it was a little bit different but i i'm i would say like um HRs of the company handle it quite well. We have we are following Slack and there are so many social Slack channels now, such as cooking, gardening, and all the hobby channels, not only just the work. We are sharing everything, whatever possible, and uh, actually coffee times, tea times, just to make sure it is open for all the company. It's not like only for the few people. So, and in some of the things like in India, they are playing like live games uh, for half an hour end of the day, just to make sure you have that team bond. We do miss team bonding, but we are coming up with uh, innovative ways of working together like this. And from the business perspective, uh, yes, uh, it, it, it might impact a bit later, but for now we are continuing the projects, whatever we are already doing. So the clients, um, you know, trust us a lot and as well as we are working together. So as far as I know, uh, if we are like uh, telling them when we are available and when we are not, just be transparent and share like, okay, this is the time where I can't be available because of my son doing something or, you know, just be transparent. I think that working well and initial two, three weeks, we worked more time than usual just to make sure we are working and, you know, maybe getting used. But now I think it's more of uh, more of like adjustment of we are making sure like okay morning nine to evening seven or eight and just kept that transparency is working a lot and from the business perspective also it is fine for next six months um, from the UK depends on the country I guess we are starting the office next month sometime uh, not for everyone. It's for the. It's uh, for you to decide whether you want it to be in the office or not. Also, only very few people. So next six months, I hope. Uh, I'm hoping it will be like this only. Most of us working from home and going when it's needed and all. So, not not really now impacted. It is getting settled a bit. So, mm, I would say just keep expectations. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting six months, that's for sure. So, uh, Aji, I, I know you're relatively new into Chattermill. Uh, wh when was it you joined there? H how much time did you have with your team before it became remote? Uh, so, I joined Chattermill in October last year. So, it was, it was sort of a good six months or like, yeah, just, just under six months before. Yeah. And, and how, how are you working now? Is there any tips or tricks that you've done and what do you think the yeah. next six months look like for you? Yeah, so, I mean... Like yeah, like similar to Pagra, like our initially like initial reaction was there was definitely a dip in productivity, so we sort of had to get used to this new situation. But after sort of two or three weeks, um, what we actually started noticing, and especially after like like right now, is a ma massive 
um, increase in productivity, but also like the team being a lot, like especially the data science team being a lot closer to each other and our engineering team. Um, and the reason for that is uh, we were anyway based in multiple locations, um, although we had sort of a core team in London uh, where I'm based. And then we had people in St. Petersburg, Moscow uh, and Berlin. And sometimes we realized that in the London team, we would maybe like do more socials or, or have more sort of informal chats that some of our other team members in different satellite offices wouldn't be part of. Uh, but now that we're all working from home, everything's like online, everything's on different platforms, etc. So that has definitely helped us um, quite a lot. And I think, um, yeah, the, the only other tip I would say is like maybe doing things that work for, for your team is really important. So, you know, things that work for our sales team are like, you know, they wanted to have a catch up every morning and every evening. Um, they're very social, very extroverted people. Um, that would have been a nightmare for, for my data scientists, like literally having two meetings, two additional meetings every day. Yeah. So we didn't do that. <laughs> Look, that sales. Data scientists don't care about that, man. Data scientists don't care. And um, one thing that I was just aware of here, actually, we've still got quite a few questions, and, and, and it's actually been a little bit apparent with the questions that come through. We clearly have a lot of people that are taking that first step. Uh, in terms of the data science journey. So, so rather than me kind of cracking on with perhaps some of the questions I'd pre-prepared, uh, we've got five or 10 minutes left. There's nine or 10 questions. I might just fire through each of the questions that we've got. Um, I'll maybe just put each question to one of the panelists rather than get four input from each. Um, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So uh, the one that's at the very top, top of the list, question from Mark Patterson, um, he's addressed it to you actually, Ori, so we'll, we'll go with you. And um, he said, with so many boot camps now uh, offering training for data scientists, have you seen the cost of recruiting the right school skills in your team reduce? No, on the contrary, they increase, which is good news for everyone, except for some. <laughs> for us, it's good news. <laughs> except for the business. Sorry, short answer. <laughs> no, I haven't seen that. Uh, and, the, and the point of that is that the reason that these boot camps exist is of this massive boom, this exponential growth of, 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 of data, data usage hence data side, the need for data scientists. So I think the need for data scientists grows more, uh, more than uh, you know, the numbers of people that are joining bootcamp. So no, no, Fantastic. no worries there. Uh, I'll come to you, Shawful, for the next one. Um, the question's from uh, Kushagra. Uh, I'm currently pursuing a master's in data scientist, actively looking for internships, but given the current COVID-19 situation, it's really hard to land a graduate scheme or internship. Um, you know, how do you things see going from that perspective? When do you think companies will be back hiring? Uh, is there any light at the end of the tunnel uh, for the graduates out there? Um, well, definitely light in the tunnel. I mean, I've been through a, a couple of recessions, not giving away my age. Um, so there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Things look always bleak, uh, but stay hope. I, I think one of the advice I'd give data scientists is that, you know, even though the title says data scientist, it is, a, it is a plethora of skills, of requirements, of experience. You know, what they have to do is focus on what they want to do. OK, the first role you should do in data science should be something that you enjoy doing to try not to work for a company or a, a sector where you won't enjoy it. Um, and mainly because the passion will come through when you talk about it, you'll have a personal interest, you want to be in that area and you can talk more than just the data science, which, which I find useful. So what I would suggest is home in on an area that you're interested in, that you're passionate in, um, and then, you know, tailor your CV. I mean, unfortunately, nowadays, it's, it's very easy just to like, provide a LinkedIn profile or send the same CV, copy and paste it or just, you know, PDF try and customize it, reach out. There's so many avenues now. You would be surprised. I mean, when I was younger, I never thought senior people would ever, you know, respond to an email and stuff. Um, but, but they did. And I'm, I'm doing the same. I'm repaying the same. I'm sure the rest of my panelists are when they get something, you know, being on this panel, we want to help out um, and help people at the beginning of the industry to move up. Because, hey, like Ori said, we, we want to retire. So we want someone to take over. And so we don't have to do the job anymore. Um, and, and, and the only way to do that is to get people in. So, um, like I said, focus in on an area and then show why you're good at it, okay? A lot of the core skills, you've just got to, you know, with that experience, it's hard to demonstrate, but show that you've done, uh, or you have the knowledge of knowing how to do it, all the steps uh, and all the processes. Perfect. Thank you, Shawful. I think the other thing is it, it will definitely come back. You know, you, everyone's working in an area with data. Companies are trying to work smarter. The data is the real valuable asset for them. That's where the profit is. So actually, as an industry, 
uh, I would hope we're, we're in a good position. Uh, I'm going to come to you, Adji, uh, keeping it uh, quick and moving. Uh, we've had a question from Grace. Um, she said that she's currently working as a data analyst in conversion rate optimization, uh, three years experience, started learning R, but would love to get into data scientists. And um, have you got any tips where people are looking to move from being an analyst to being a scientist? Yeah, so we've so we've had a few, quite a few people actually um, uh, at Sky sort of make that transition. I mean, the first thing I would sort of say is like, yeah, making sure that you, you transition into data science for the right reasons. Like, and you know, it's not necessarily because of the hard, but because you know, you're really passionate about solving quite hard challenges using you know a range of different statistical and sort of computational methods. Um, but if if that is the case, then I would sort of recommend like definitely not just going straight into like like deep learning or Bayes and deep learning, but like like really building a strong foundation in in maths and statistics first. Like so, you know, there are loads of great research out there on statistical learning, um, but also like absolutely like core foundations all, uh, in maths. Sometimes maybe um, are are sort of a bit different for analyst roles than for data science. So I'd say sort of say yeah, like brush up on like probability calculus, all all that stuff online first, and then start pursuing um you know like uh so the more sort of uh, hyped up techniques such as deep learning okay fantastic and do you think uh, making that transition it's easier to do it within the same company so perhaps transition from an analyst to a scientist within one company rather than to change company while you make that step yeah especially especially if um you know like for example at sky we definitely allowed people to like um get onto conversion courses conversion masters or sort of diploma certificate programs um but yeah if you're at the same company you already have the domain knowledge hopefully of that company so that's definitely not something you have to kind of learn from scratch um because that's the last thing you want to do if you want to go into a new oh, setting it. yeah it makes sense it makes sense uh, i'm going to come to you uh, now bagia uh, the question is from carol white uh, it fits quite nicely with your talk uh, and some of it may already be covered but we'll, we'll see what your thoughts are uh, i'm guessing carol's from a, more of a data science background and her question was how do you get the best out of data science teams uh, when there's already an established data engineering or data architecture function um, i guess obviously we can flip that round with you from the engineering side you know what what are the key tips for getting engineering and science you know working very closely together so having a protocol definitely helps uh, in especially in quantum black there is a protocol like data engineering these are the deliverables and data science is these are the deliverables basically even even not even in quantum like even before i'm working having a set of responsibilities like this is what we are doing and having regular check-ins checkouts also uh, from my experience uh, having a dds catch up helps a lot like data engineer data science catch up uh, once in a week and show them like okay this is what i'm doing with otherwise there will be a disconnect between both the teams the data engineers go and do the data and data scientists go and do the models so to find the balance between them if we have catch-ups more often it helps a lot instead of involving the entire teams just this group who actually work on it every day uh, would be really helpful and they also sometimes they get interested uh, maybe i'm answering the previous question there are so many people in quantum lag who actually a data engineer converted to machine learning engineer and the data scientist converted to machine learning engineer they try to find their way while they're working along so yeah. that's also helpful so i would say regular catch-ups is definitely helpful perfect thank you very much um, i'm a little bit conscious of time uh, we've got towards the end of our allocated uh, slot for tonight um, i'm gonna uh, just throw one question out same question for all of you uh, before we wrap things up um, in terms of uh, how you see things progression. We've talked about the next six months. We've talked specifically about the pandemic and stuff like that. I'd be interested to see uh, what, uh, where you see, uh, how you see data science progressing uh, over the next five years. Uh, what do you think the key areas of development will be uh, over the next five years? So I'll start with you, Ori, and then we'll fire around everyone uh, and go from there, if that's okay. I think everything, I mean, everything data science is going to, is going to embrace pretty much the entirety of uh, the entire social aspect of life, pretty much. Uh, wherever data science is not applied now, it will pretty soon, I think. Uh, 
that's probably good and also scary at the same time. We can start philosophical conversations here. There are risks. We need to be extremely cautious about that. Um, AI, AI is going to go through a boom. Uh, again, we got to be a human race kind of thing. We got to be extremely, extremely cautious, but at the same time, a brace change. So this is, I think, the fine balance that uh, we have to keep in our heads at all times. So embrace it, but uh, critically, and it's only going to skyrocket. I mean, it's incredible, I think. Perfect. We could have a whole separate uh, webinar on ethics, I think, as well. But uh, we'll, we'll save that for another another day. So, at Shawful, what, what's your predictions over the next five years? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it is interesting. I, I think what will happen is there will be a generalist data scientist who will go into organisations where they're not big enough to hire big teams. So there's like a hand, you know, one or two of them who can do a bit of everything, right? So, um, and the, the impact of data science uh, will, will be significant, but not huge. Um, but in other organizations, you're going to end up with specialists. You're going to have people who are going to be very deep and very knowledgeable about certain areas. Um, and in fact, you probably end up with consultancies or um, companies that build data science augmentation tools for data scientists. Um, so, you know, if you imagine the web, you know, before when you wanted to build a website, you had to know HTML. Now you get WordPress, you get Wix, so you've got people who can create websites without having to know how HTML or code works. Um, so you're going to end up with similar. You're going to end up with some data scientists who will be augmented by uh, data science technologies to help them uh, do their job. Others who will have very deep knowledge. They will be the people who can, who, who, who've probably, you know, and this is where I guess masters, PhDs will come in useful because unless you've got that deep understanding of statistical knowledge or computations, um, you know, it, it's going to be hard to be able to compete uh, in this space. Um, the other thing is obviously, uh, I think a lot of companies will start to wake up. I think post. COVID that they, they need to have digital transformations, you know, um, and, you know, especially when companies have seen sales go from, you know, right at the top to almost zero. Um, uh, so I think part of digital transformation is data, you know, data powers a lot of digital transformation and uh, organizations will need to be thinking about that, what they do with their data. They can't just let it sit. It is a competitive advantage. And so therefore they need to hire the right people uh, to do that. Uh, the, the one warning I, I would give, though, is because I think th there's a lot of hype around data science and people are, as someone mentioned, doing boot camps or they're just changing their title from being a data analyst to a data scientist. I think as more people who, who are probably intermediate now you know, in their career go to senior levels in five years time, they'll be far more knowledgeable about data science. So when they're recruiting, they'll be able to filter out people. Um, you know, I mean, I, I've never been hired by someone who knows data or analytics. Uh, you know, in, in my career. Now that I'm at the senior level when I'm interviewing, you know, I'm spotting this, the, the type of people who I think, you know, aren't, don't really have the right skills uh, to be calling themselves the data scientist. I think we're going to have more of those people now in senior position in five years time um, who, who will be doing the recruiting and, and be able to filter between those who are truly data scientists and, and not so. Perfect. Thank you very much, Shawful. Uh, I'll come to you, uh, Aji, and then we'll finish up with you, Bagia. Saving the best till last there. So over to you, Aji. Great. Um, so, yeah, I agree with um, a lot of the points that Ori and Shawful already made. So this idea of, like, I, I can't sort of imagine a single sort of facet of um, the commercial world not being touched by data or data science work and obviously the yeah, danger is part of that like that so I think that's definitely the case but also this idea that I sure will briefly touched upon which is this level of abstraction so uh, you know I think citizen data science will become much more uh, popular and important because of a shortage of data scientists um, and yes you won't necessarily need to hire you know an NL like a national language processing specialist um, but in some cases, you'll be able to like, you know, buy the tools that can abstract away all that complexity. So I think more of those systems will start becoming uh, dominant. And then, yeah, um, I think uh, it's safe to say that there won't necessarily be an AI winter, but uh, there, there is likely to be a bit of an AI autumn where maybe a lot of the extreme hype around specific technologies um, is a bit overkill in some cases. And, and that might, um, yeah, sort of start like plateauing a bit. Okay. Thank you very much, Ajay. Uh, Bagya. Uh, I would say like uh, after this COVID thing happens, everyone realizes like we are talking like this because of AI and the uh, digital world. If that's not there, we can't really do this, right? And we 
I, I don't think anyone realized much like we lost something in the life. We are with the families and we are able to talk to the people, able to work and doing things. So I definitely see the increase uh, of AI and the uh, AA in this space for the next five years. I would be surprised if we have more robots coming and, you know, working for us, right? So you never know, basically. So I'm, I'm so looking forward to it. And uh, I'm going to echo what uh, everyone said as well. It's not the skill or technology. It's about what you actually good at and what you want to become. Just be sure about that and focus on that. Rather than you want to become a data scientist or you want to become a data engineer, first understand your passion and just work towards that. And as well as understand the, you know, the problem behind it rather than you know, just let me go and learn Python. Let me look, go and learn Spark. Just you know, focus on the problem first and try to you know, work towards that. That's the message. Yeah. Very good tip to finish with. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers today, Bagya, Ori, Shawful, and Aji. Uh, it's been great having you. Uh, really enjoyed the lightning talks. And, uh, and as ever, it's really nice to get everyone's perspective. I uh, hope you've uh, enjoyed being part of the Data Science Festival. Uh, at some point, hopefully, we're back into live events. And uh, it'd be great to get you guys in. Uh, this would normally be the point where I'd be getting a round of applause for you. And we'd be perhaps having a glass of beer to celebrate. Um, but yeah, sadly not today, but it's been fantastic having you uh, and I'd like to thank you very much for being part of the community uh, and hopefully we get to see you all again soon. So thank you very much. Thanks thank everybody. Cheers guys. See you later. Bye. Great. Thank you. Bye bye.